Welcome back to Website and TV. I'm Gemma Houghton. I'm very pleased today to be joined again by Rand Fishkin, who's here to talk to us about anything and everything to do with the world of SEO. So, hey, Rand, thank you for being here again. Oh, thanks for having me, Gemma. Pleasure. So, with Moz, in the last few months, you kind of took a different tack and went back to kind of the roots of SEO. So, what was the reason behind that? And why do you, obviously, that means that you think SEO is still pretty big? Yeah, I, uh, for me, the, the two big drivers are, a, yes, SEO is still huge and it's still growing. Uh, and I don't think it ever ended up merging with all these other web marketing fields. Mm -hmm. It remained its own discipline. Uh, it remains something that businesses and organizations and people invest in separately. And then the second one is, um, I'm going to quote one of my favorite TV characters, Ron Swanson, who said, never half-ass two things, whole ass one thing. Yeah. And I, I think that focus is something that um, Moz had been lacking a little bit. And it's been really nice, really nice to get back to, hey, we all do this one thing and yeah. focus on that. And then you've recently talked about some search and new searcher data that you've kind of de developed, discovered, um, that gives a bit of a sense of how the search landscape's looking like right now. So what are the key findings you've made? Uh, well, so this was this was us partnering with Jumpshot. Basically, we'd um, been buying some data from them, and I said, "Hey, you guys have this huge clickstream panel of these millions of searchers. That is plenty enough to do a representative sample set of all the activity that happens on Google in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Can we ask you a bunch of questions?" And so I sent them over, you know, like thirty detailed questions for them to dig into yeah. their data set. They did that. Uh, they looked at October of last year, which was sort of a a relatively stable month. It didn't have holidays in it. It didn't have um, a lot of the ups and downs that you see with November and December in yeah. particular. Uh, and so they analyzed that data and then told us a bunch of cool stuff about, you know, percentage of clicks on Google and search searches and what happens after people mm -hmm. search. So a couple of the things that I thought were most fascinating, um, they have mobile and desktop. Mm -hmm. So one of the fascinating ones was, uh, let's see, it was on mobile. 2% of searches result in a click on a paid ad. Um, another, I think it's about 50-ish uh, percent, a little more than that, uh, result in a click on an organic result. And then you have, you know, this huge swath, uh, 48, you know, 50% of people who don't click at all. I think it might have been even higher. It might have been like 57% of people wow. don't click on any result on mobile. Like the whatever Google gives them answers their search entirely. They don't need to dig any further, which is amazing. Yeah. And then on desktop, those percentages were, were a bit lower. So it was like 2.8% um, paid ad click. Um, I can't remember exactly, although we can do the math here. So it would be around 60-ish uh, percent were... Um, click on an organic result and then 30, I think it was 37% uh, don't click at all. So 37% not clicking, that's still quite high, but you know, on mobile you're talking, yeah. uh, you know, half that again. Yeah. Which is quite a significant thing for website owners, you know, businesses to really think about because that totally changes the way that you then have to present your content and think about the information you're giving. Yeah, I mean, you, Google is really providing the user experience of your brand and your content when you're delivering that and no one's clicking. And so it's weird, you you know, I think a lot of people think of uh, user experience design beginning once you get to your property, once yeah. you get to your website or your app. But in fact, user experience begins where the visitor starts their journey, which very often is Google, and that's very often the end point yeah. too, which is crazy. So what does this mean really then for how you need to approach your optimization efforts, your SEO efforts? Now, you know, the, the, the reason potentially for some of this is that there's much more of information available directly on the search page. There's this answer box, there's the knowledge graph, there's carousels, there's so many things that maybe people are just totally overwhelmed and don't know where to click. But how do you even start to think about how you really make the most of that really valuable real estate? I think... Uh... Keyword research is where is where that starts. And in that keyword research stage, one of the things that I think many smart SEOs are doing uh, and maybe a few more of us need to do is 
to essentially look at the list of keywords and, and uh, analyze all of the SERP features. So, you know, whether that's knowledge graph or featured snippet or people also ask box or uh, videos or images or tweets or what have you, right? Yeah. Uh, carousels, all these many, many things that yeah. can show up there. And then essentially say, okay, um, let's go in order of uh, visibility and demand. And basically the ones that have high demand and where there's lots of visibility for these SERP features, we need to do optimization that isn't just our website and our ranking um, or even where we appear in the results in these features, but also what do these features look like? What information do they pre present and say? Uh, and how can we tweak and tune that? So can we, through uh, behavioral patterns, through content, change what the people also ask boxes, which ones appear, which one appears high up, right? If I can get lots of people asking that question by doing a bunch of uh, authoring of content all over yeah. the web and answering that question on Quora and um, influencing people to search for those kinds of things, well, then maybe I can get that PAA box to be the one that I want yeah. and that'll you know come up with my result in addition to you know, how do I get the knowledge graph or the carousel to show the cards that I want or the, the pieces of information that I want, which again is more of an influence campaign on the web than it is just a, you know, website optimization tactic. But if, if you can do those two things, right, identify the opportunity yeah. and then execute on it, I think you can control a lot more of the search user experience. Obviously, this is a bit of a kind of difficult concept for many people to get their head around and probably for the kind of higher level management even more so because suddenly it's saying well we're not so worried if everyone doesn't come through to our website it's not about getting everyone to our site which of course it is because yeah you've got this great content that everybody comes to and it's brilliant but actually the whole point of that is that then you want them to buy your product or sign up for your course or whatever it is and how does that journey then we're going to shift i mean i think that a lot of that is um the need to say to management one of two things first off user journeys are long and they involve many different visits and some of those may not be visits some of those may be on external content anytime that takes place you know we want to be in that journey yeah and then the second piece is to say it's either us or our competitors so you choose what you believe <laughs> yeah. right maybe you believe it's not that you know it's not that valuable for us to be there but do you believe that it would uh, ch would it change your mind if our key competitor was in that same spot and they controlled that data? And if the answer is yes, mm. well, then we need to do some SEO on it. And when it comes to then the kind of traditional optimization of websites, so your meta tags, you're looking at all of these things, is that still then as important or does that almost diminish in, in importance because I, of I all these other things? I don't think it does, right? Because what the crazy part about this, right, in the... In the um, data that we've seen over the years is that while, you know, um, featured snippets and all these different kinds of answer boxes and uh, all of this, all of these SERP features have come in and taken over a lot of the visibility yeah. and the experience of Google's front page um, or the, the search results page, it has not diminished the amount of traffic that Google sends out to other websites. So essentially, search has just grown so much that your opportunity in traffic is still growing. Yeah. It was just as big as it was five years ago or six years mm -hmm. ago and still growing. Uh, but now there's this whole other optimization opportunity in the featured snippets, in the, you know, in the SERP features of all kinds um, to get your brand or your information where you want it to be. And so it's almost like uh, SEO of old, still big, still growing. New SEO, uh, now that's big and growing too. Better do both. So instead of all these scaremongers that say SEO is dead, actually SEO is doubling in size. SEO has got even more potential than it's ever had before. Uh, who else but SEOs does all that work to yeah. appear in the SERP features and optimize, you know, the all these different kinds of blocks? That's still SEO, yeah. right? There's no, It's not like, I was saying in the keynote this morning, right? Like, It's not like there's this new pack of marketers who's come in and they're like, oh, you're old school SEOs. You just do 10 blue links. Yeah. <laughs> we're the new ones. We do this other stuff. And so yeah. we're, we're pushing you out. No, no. It's us. It's an evolution. It's all like Yeah, we have to do it. And what do you think this means for ads then? Obviously, the figure of that is kind of surprising to me. Only 2% of people clicking on ads. Obviously, that's a lot of people and that still makes Google a lot of money. But that's where it makes its money. Yeah, if it's got all of these features that are all pushing the ads out the way that people, you know, can just look at on the page and leave. How do you know, how is that going to work? Is that likely to become, are they likely to kind of move towards the advertising end of things? 
Uh, so I think that Google is going to keep getting more and more creative and more subtle with their advertising. You can see how subtle they've got with the little, yeah. you know, outline green ad box that you yeah. can barely see. <laughs> um, but uh, despite that, people are still clearly biasing a little bit away from the advertising mm -hmm. clicks, or maybe the ads are not as hyper relevant as they as they need to be. But Google, given that uh, AdWords continues to grow, the and the growth of Google's advertising grows. I don't think Google's actually stressing that much about mm -hmm. it right now. Yeah. Um, and I think marketers probably don't need to either. If your ROI with AdWords is good, great, keep it up. Yeah. Uh, if it's not, you need to optimize those campaigns. It's not like opportunity is being lost no. there, right? Google's gone from a maximum of three ads above the fold to four on desktop. Yeah. I think they've gone from a maximum of two on mobile to, I think it's three or four, yeah. sometimes four, right? On mobile. Um, and the ones below the results, uh, yeah. the organic results on mobile as well, which seem to sometimes actually work okay. Uh, so there's not diminished opportunity there. It's just that now we know what the percent is. And so we yeah. go, wait, that's way lower than I thought. Yeah. I think there might actually be more opportunity than we originally Even presumed, thought. right? Like yeah. Google's ceiling has not been hit. Yeah, definitely not. And then there's a lot of talk at the moment around this mobile first in index from Google. How does that impact the way that you need to optimize for all of these features? You know, what are the differences between the desktop and mobile versions? And is it a case that it should really be the mobile area that businesses are concentrating on? Uh, yeah, I think when it comes to SERP features, Google is mobile first. Um, and a lot of their SERP features that are answer focused are mobile first. And therefore, a lot of our uh, SEO work needs to be on our mobile versions of our site. Now, for a large majority, I'm not going to say the overwhelming majority, but a large majority of websites, your mobile and your desktop don't provide different content, no. right? It's essentially responsive design yeah. or adaptive design with very little uh, delta between the two. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a huge stress, right? Yeah. You're essentially trying to make that content fit what Google needs. But for the websites who are, you know, in that, that sort of weird uh, space in between, right? And they are doing the, uh, they have a mobile version that's fairly different to their desktop version. The mobile versions maybe trying to load less content because yeah. they know the connections slower, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Um, I think in, in those cases, you do need to stress a little bit about, wait, are all the content and features that we need to provide to Google in the uh, mobile version of our site? Because mobile first indexing means that your desktop rankings could be based on your mobile experience. And that could mean that you lose out on you know long tail rankings or on certain feature opportunities if your mobile site doesn't provide all that. So it's a whole kind of holistic view you need to take of it all really it's not thinking right this is the mobile version this is the desktop. well certainly i think um there's the holistic piece and then there's also the when we look at do we when we answer the question or try and answer the question of are we doing a good job of executing on potential opportunity in google um on our website look at the mobile version not the desktop yeah. version right and that that can be something where you know, the SEO person is very often on a desktop device when they're doing their SEO yeah. work. And so you have to either use an emulator or your mobile yeah. to make sure, right? Yeah, that not just assume that what you did on not the desktop. Assume, yeah, yeah, don't assume that like, oh, everything looks kosher on desktop, we're fine. Yeah, because that may not be the case. And then what about apps when we're talking about from an SEO perspective? Because again, we've seen that, you know, there's been a lot of more development in the ability to have apps ranking and apps do appear in search results way more than they ever did. Is that still an area, especially with the mobile first kind of push, an area that businesses should be looking into more or not so much? Gemma, how, how is it possible that I didn't ask JumpShot to get app click-through rate? <laughs> I'm going to do that. Okay. This is right after we finish filming. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask like, wait, I need the click-through rate on apps because that's a great, great question. Um, and I think we should try and figure that out and not just... Like we should ask now and then we should look at it six months from now and a year from yeah. now and see what the trend is like. Um, as far as apps go, we have actually seen in the, uh, to the degree that they are included in Google, I think a year ago, 18 months ago, we were all freaking out thinking app results were going to be taking over a lot yeah. of mobile results. And that did not happen. And it didn't happen for two reasons. One, uh, the app world either was or became winner take all, mm -hmm. right? So if you, 
Uh, if you are outside of the top 10 apps, you are essentially invisible. You're on, you know, statistically yeah. speaking, no one's phone. <laughs> yeah. um, it just doesn't matter that much. And as a result, your app results can't rank in Google for the vast majority of people. You know, for the small number of folks who might be in your audience, when they're searching Google, like, yes, maybe you can appear for them. But it's sort of like, you know... Um, it's a heck of a lot of effort for very little return. Precisely, precisely. Um, you know, you'd have to be one of only a handful of organizations to where that would make true yeah. sense. Uh, the other thing we've seen is two other things. Uh, one, that um, getting into... That, that Google is showing is not showing nearly the number of apps, uh, just apps to download in the results as we thought they might, mm -hmm. right? So the the percentage of results that come back with you know an app suggestion in mobile is not as high as we thought, and it's bifurcated based on your device type and your download speed and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, and then third is that uh, progressive web apps have been on the rise, yeah, and they provide. Almost all, I think there's two or three features that they that they can't do that a uh, native app can do. They're not quite as fast and responsive, but everything else about them is stellar. Yeah. And so a lot of the reason to develop a separate mobile app yeah. is going away, and a progressive web app just makes a tremendous amount of sense for, for many, many folks. And then another thing to consider, there's so many things to consider, it's pretty scary, is voice search. Yeah. That's, again, something that's had a lot of discussion around it. It's going to be the thing. Nobody's going to type ever again. What do you think to that? <laughs> I mean, so I, I was on the subway this morning, right? And it was jam-packed. And there were lots of people searching on their mobile devices. But maybe because they were extremely well-behaved German you know, subway passengers. Yeah. And they are. <laughs> silent <laughs> impeccable like silent um no voice search right yeah. I, I think voice search is actually still awkward like yeah. you'll do it in your home you might do it a little bit with friends uh you probably will do it in the, in your car but beyond that that yeah. so far at least the, the i think the the social awkwardness of it and having everyone in, around you know exactly what you're looking for right then. Yeah, that's it's true. Just, <laughs> it's awkward. Um, and so we still see not that much. Also, I don't think voice search, I don't think voice replacing typing changes much of anything from a web marketer's perspective. Yeah. What changes things from a web marketer's perspective and where, like, where, we get, where I get seriously scared is uh, two places. So to a lesser extent... It is smart assistants, right? Smart assistants are basically ones where they say, you're trying to accomplish this, let me help you try and accomplish it rather than serving you up results that you click on and go to other people's websites. Yeah. And that takes away opportunity, um, but not entirely. What takes away opportunity entirely is voice answers. So if your mobile device is giving you the answer, the yeah. one answer, well, there's no results to look at. Yeah. There's no... I mean, maybe, maybe the voice answer will say something like brought to you by WebCertain, but yeah. maybe it, will, it probably, probably not. won't at all, yeah. right? It's not even going to mention your domain name. And so now you've given Google all your information, mm -hmm. let them crawl all your content. Now they can answer any question and they don't even have to cite you. Yeah. That gets spooky. And that's also a little bit scary from the user point of view, because actually you're going to get told an answer that... Google has decided it's the first one. Now, that's the case now, but at least you can scan down and go, is that what everyone's saying? Or do I think if it's voice search and somebody just tells you and you take that as read, then, whoa, <laughs> the power. And Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think Search Engine Land did a great um, piece recently, I think it was a couple weeks ago, um, on a bunch of political searches in the United States and how the answers were completely wrong, right? If you, you know, asked, um, I can't remember... Uh, like, is Obama planning a coup, right? Like a military coup to take over the government. If only. <laughs> I, see, I think that might be too far, but okay. um, yeah, you know, opinions vary. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, Google had a, a little featured snippet. Someone someone had done some SEO, yeah. some like far right wing website had done some SEO mm -hmm. and they'd done a good job and they had the featured snippet so that the answer was yes, you know, Obama's plotting this and this and this. Um, when in fact you can see he's off jet skiing yeah. with like Richard having a Branson lovely time and not thinking time. about that yeah <laughs> um, and uh, and I think that that gets into a spooky place right because yeah. you can have these these answers it doesn't have to be politics right it could be anything medical stuff right imagine if it's you know what should I do if someone is having anaphylactic shock oh you should I don't know rub their ear <laughs> yeah no that's a terrible idea but someone yeah. could SEO for it and 
the yeah. answer could come out of you know Google Voice, and that gets real scary. Yeah, that is. Yeah, and there's not really a lot you can do about that, and have to see how things go, and I mean, hopefully common sense will prevail. No, no, you really have to count on you have to count on Google being conservative enough with it until they have some yeah. true verification process yeah. for data and information. Um, and right now, that's a little sketchy. Yeah, absolutely. And then another thing we haven't mentioned is image search. And I think there was some quite interesting statistics from the the data you got back. Yeah. And your insights so, about that. Um, so I, I have a theory about it. And my theory is based <laughs> on uh, based on what happens in October in the United States. But so in this month of October, uh, basically, you know, JumpShot saw, I think, something like 57% of all searches performed um, on the web per were performed on Google.com. And then another almost 25% were performed on Google Images, which is insane. Yeah. Like it it kind of blows my mind. Now that's not unique searches, right? So that could be one person who just really loves image search going to town all day or, you know, more than one. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think that it might be related to Halloween. <laughs> so because, because Americans yeah. are obsessed with Halloween and because yeah. we all make costumes for our kids yeah. and for ourselves and we look at other people's and costumes. Parties and, yeah. There's part, yeah, so it might be that there is some reason why Google Images had a huge spike. We'll, we'll try and verify that by looking at data from a few other yeah. months. Um, but no matter what caused that spike, there's no way that Google Images is smaller than like 10%, yeah. which is m m huge. It's way bigger than I ever thought it could be. No wonder a few years ago, remember Google took away, when you used to click an image, they take you to the website. Yeah. Now, when you click an image, it just opens up, it just yeah. opens up the image. No wonder, there must have been an incredible <laughs> amount of traffic there yeah. and Google was like, no, no, Cut. we're taking that. Yeah. And yeah. also, I'm sure they didn't want people to have to load the whole web page to get just the to experience. Image, yeah. So, yeah, that one's remarkable. Like image search SEO in certain verticals is probably... A massive opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And again, one that gets left and you know put down at the bottom of the pile beyond you know we must optimize our key information pages. But actually, yeah. Well, and no surprise, missing. right? It's because course, yeah. I mean, you, if you don't he get would the click, it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. and if you if you can't yeah. see the traffic coming to your site, yeah. you're just not going to optimize for it. Um, and maybe you might be missing out on a tremendous opportunity to influence the right audience. Yeah, definitely. And then the final thing I want to ask you about is software, which is yeah. a topic you kind of like, I guess. Because, of course, you know, all these things that are changing, again, we, this is not new, but, you know, there's a lot of SEO software out there now, but it's having to adapt and, oh, and yeah. move pretty fast, I guess, to, to deal with all of this. So Just to keep up. How, how is it going to be able to keep up with all these changes, do you think? I don't think it'll ever keep up with all of them. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to another SEO software entrepreneur. Um, this was a few years ago, but... Uh, sort of fascinating, you know, we talk about in, in the software world and startup world, you always talk about this product market fit, yeah. right? When you found product market fit and the product does all the things that, it, that the customer needs. And in SEO, there's no such thing. Like no one has ever achieved product market fit in the yeah, history of SEO no. software. We've all just ever been chasing it. And mm -hmm. I think that is something that makes our field very different and unique from a lot of others. Um, but it also means that, you know, I think the companies that can execute on this and can make it simple and accessible and understandable for people um, and can stay not too far out of date, right? I think today you have to be tracking SERP features. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you have to be tracking what's in every people also ask box. Yeah. That might be not that useful. The click-through rate is not that high. Um, you know, so I think that, that you have to make smart decisions and trade-offs about what you're going to invest in and... Um, and try and chase that market. And from a kind of SEO point of view, using an SEO using software, again, there's so much, there's so much that they need probably insight into how do what, you know, what questions should they be asking themselves and the vendors to decide which, which software is the best fit for them? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a really good idea to go in with a bunch of problems that you know need solving, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's, hey, we have to see all the SERP features and how often they appear. Hey, we need to, uh, we're going to be doing keyword research on a regular you know, monthly or quarterly cadence. Hey, we're going to be doing uh, content optimization on a weekly basis because we're producing weekly uh, pieces of new content. So we yeah. better make sure there's an on-page thing. And we need to be tracking rankings. And we know that we've got 
uh, you know, about 5,000 pages that are receiving traffic. So we should estimate somewhere between tracking 15 and 20,000 keywords, mm -hmm. right? So you know those things ahead of time. You bring those to your conversation about which piece of software should we choose. Yeah. And you usually know your budget too, which yeah. can help narrow it down. Yeah, great. Well, loads to think about there, loads to talk about. It was always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank Thomas. you. Cheers.